the Ask Mississippi uh, Alexa uh, tool that's out there. And today he's going to talk a little bit about how to uh, build chatbots for government, some of the use cases, and, and how to make it happen. So with that, Eric Jernigan, welcome. Oh, and I, I also think it's awesome. He told me that uh, from Mississippi, he'd never woken up before the snow in the ground. Yeah. So he's been uh, here for about 36 hours, and he's experienced three different was, that Colorado was a, That was a first. <laughs> um, and actually, um, the good news is, is I got the email notification today. We are now in the Google Home. So um, that's, that's awesome. Um, so, thanks Fred. Um, like Fred said, um, my name is Eric Jernigan. I, was, I am the Manager of Application Development for Mississippi Interactive. Um, though I have developer in my title, I pinky promise that I won't show any code and, and bore y'all. <laughs> um, so let's get started. Um, so first I want you to think about uh, what types of applications you use in your daily lives. Um, you know, that might be Facebook or Slack or, or Skype or my personal favorite, the uh, Domino's Pizza Bot. Um, and then how can you take those applications and uh, move them over to where they can be uh, used by your, your own customers and assist them in reaching out to them? Um, and as you can see, people using web-based chatbot platforms or applications is, is uh, increasing every year. Um, we need to start thinking about um, how you can reach and inter interact with those customers more and more. Um, and the cool thing about chatbots is that you don't necessarily have to build a new platform or a native application in order to introduce your, project, your products and your services to those customers. Um, it's just a web interface and it's, um, you can just upload it within a matter of minutes. Um, here are some potential use cases for, uh, for chatbots. Um, you might want to build a FAQ bot like Missy, um, or you might need a solution for your office administrator uh, to free up his or her time in answering phone calls about the same FAQ question, um, then free up her time to answer more important calls. Or uh, you might want a password reset so you don't personally have to call the help desk to get your password reset every 10 minutes. Or a bot that I personally built that uh, looks up Bitcoin prices <laughs> and buys and sells them. <laughs> um, so what actually makes a great bot? Um, you know, a great bot is something that easily solves uh, users' problems something that can reduce frustration on the user's end. Um, it gives them at least simulated choices in, um, in a dialogue, so you can, meaning you can direct them to the appropriate answer question. Um, it's intuitive and it's easy for the user to use if they know how to do a conversation. They probably know how to use a chatbot. Um, and then something that solves this very specific customer problem. Uh, you want to try and aim for 80 to 90 percent of a, um, of a uh, machine learning confidence rating so that anything below 80 percent will actually kind of wind up frustrating the user and anything above 90 is really just kind of hard to get <laughs> um, in teaching your, your machines. Um, and there's really no learning curve for the customers. It's just a conversation. If they can type and talk, then they can use a chatbot. Um, so when we first started de designing Missy, uh, everybody in the office kind of made fun of me because I started actually referring to Missy as a, uh, a third person, like she was actually an employee of the office. I would say stuff like, she should do this, or I want her to respond to, to uh, this question. Um, and in saying that, that made it a little easier to try and create a personality around the bot. Um, and that's okay. Uh, you know, you want your bot to be creative and approachable. Um, and you, it's okay to use a regional dialect. Like in Mississippi, we obviously have y'all and gonna and let me go do this and <laughs> stuff that is uniquely Mississippi. Um, we included that in some of her uh, 
dialogue and conversation outputs. Um, <clears throat> and then you need to decide what you want to do with your bot. So what is your bot's job? Is it a god bot or does it do, do, do and see all things? Or is it sole purpose in life, is, and my favorite show is Rick and Morty, but is it sole purpose in life to serve butter? Um, you know, it's, I would lean more towards doing the, um, the specialist kind of bots because the god bots are a little bit harder to maintain and, and, and build everything around. Okay, so that's kind of the beginning part, so now we can kind of get into the weeds. Um, you know, there's several different types of frameworks to, uh, to build your bot. Um, there's the Rasa Core, there's the third party Dexter app, I think is the DexterApp.com. And then what Mississippi decided to go with was the Microsoft Bot Framework. Uh, we chose the Bot Framework because it was easy to build um, one bot uh, one code base and hosted in the state data center and then um, all while publishing to all of these different channels of Slack or Facebook or Twilo or whatever. Um, and in your first few design sessions, um, we wanted to see how Missy would, her conversation would flow. So we, um, we built a whole bunch of charts and graphs and flow charts of different conversationals outputs essentially a tree. Um, and then we found a third party service called botsociety.io that would actually mimic um, Missy's conversation with a fake user conversation. I'll show you that in a second. Um, I would always lean towards creating an eject button because no matter how many times somebody might ask for give me a human, um, they really want to talk to a human. <laughs> so build that kind of functionality into it, either by using a third party service like Slack or um, I forget who we, we do for the, our chat agent. <coughs> um, and then when you're signing off, um, always think about trying to have a rating system in place so that way you can improve your machine learning and your, um, you know, you get instant kind of feedback of was this question helpful to the customer? Um, I'll show you the bot society thing real quick. Um, and this is what we use to mock Missy. Um, it, and you, this way you can get a, a real good feel of, you know, what kind of questions you would like to ask and what kind of uh, answers you may or may not receive. So, y'all get the point. <laughs> okay. Um, so, when you're actually starting to get into the language part of the bot, um, the sentiment analysis and trying to figure out what a user wants to say, that is the extremely, the very, very hard part about getting your bot right. Um, us humans know the answer to this question, you know, king is to man as queen is to woman. Um, but it takes a bot an incredibly long time to figure that out. Um, and then uh, whenever bots can't figure out what it is, um, I have a hard time believing that the Terminator is going to happen. <laughs> um, so in the act of trying to teach your bots about the language and the human text, um, that is actually called natural language processing, or NLP for short. Um, and specifically, that's taking your sentence structure and having the computer figure out what the nouns, the pronouns, the adjectives, the verbs are part of your text. Um, and like two years ago, it was really tough on developers because uh, there weren't really any natural language processing frameworks out there, so we all had to do it on ourselves. Um, and since the kind of the bot craze and they've been sprouting up like mushrooms, um, there's been a massive movement of uh, hundreds of third party libraries that do your machine learning and cut your development time in half, um, which is really kind of awesome. <clears throat> 
Um, and here are some examples of those platforms. Um, the Lewis.ai is through the Microsoft Cognitive Services Program, and that's through an Azure uh, application. The uh, Ask framework by Alexa is uh, your Amazon. That's how you build your Alexa skills. And it was API.ai. Now it's called Dialogflow. That's, that's how you build your Google Home. And then uh, recently I've been trying to port over all of Missy's, Missy's internal um, language processing over to this uh, Rasa NLU, Natural Language Understanding, um, because we want to kind of keep all of our PII and our database queries in-house, and that's what the Rasa NLU gives you. All the other stuff is third-party services where you send your data over to. So if you don't feel comfortable sending your PII uh, data over to Amazon, then you know there's alternatives to that personal information. <laughs> um, so when you're building your NLP structures, there's two types of uh, ways you can classify them. There's your casual intents, and then there's your business intents. Your casual intents are simply your, uh, your small talk. Uh, and those can be broken into positive and to negative affirmations. So, um, you know, your hi, your bye, your howdy, your yes, your no. Um, and this is your best place to be personable. So, like, this would be a great place to put your welcome message and tell and kind of let the user know that they are actually talking to a bot. You can be as witty as you want or as serious as you want. Um, I lean towards more the witty way. <laughs> Um, and then the second type is your business intents. This is, uh, what are you actually trying to do with your bot? This is your core process. You know, it's connecting to your databases. It's connecting to your data structures. Um, when building your business intent, try your best to make your developer happy by naming them appropriately. Um, he, they will thank you. Um, if you look at, we can, we can take this, uh, intent that I wrote, for example, you know, what's the score of the Broncos game? A great way to name that would be get score by team. Um, it's just a way of classifying it and organizing your intents. Um, okay, so inside of intents, you now have your variables and your properties. Those are the things that you want to map. So using the previous example, what is the score of the Broncos game? Your you're obviously looking for uh, the variables of score and Broncos. So that way you can query uh, your, your libraries and go find a, a score of the Broncos game from ESPN or whatever. Um, and the process of finding those in entities is called uh, part of sentence uh, tagging. And probably the, the best POS tagging software out there is from the Stanford University. They do a really good job of their natural language libraries. Um, and like naming and int intent naming, always be kind to your developers and name them appropriately. Okay, so I'm going to get a little bit, tad bit more complex. Um, you have variables and now you can have variables that have variables inside of them. But if you look at this example, it may make sense. Uh, find me a red Ferrari convertible. Um, so your intent would be search for car and then your variables would be something called car detail. And inside car detail, you could have your make, your model, your color. Um, and we, as developers, just use that to simplify our data queries. So that way we can write one query against all of our tables and make it snappy and so the customers don't have to wait. Um, um, so now that you know kind of what an intent and an entity are, um, you need to actually take those, package them up and take those over and then ship them off to your training engine. Um, and then your training engine, its whole purpose is to improve the confidence rating of the machine learning. So that way users can, when they have a question on their chatbot, that it will confidently return the answer and you're, you're not given bad data. Um, and my, my simple rules for training is you can never train enough, always be training. Just, it doesn't hurt anything. <laughs> um, 
So when you're training, you want to, the best place to get your training information is from real life um, scenarios. So use your Facebook posts, your Slack conversations, any logs that you may have in your backend systems. Um, heck, there's even a, like a one petabyte file on, online that you can download that's every movie script ever written. Um, that's a great way to get a question and a response because typically it's two people talking with each other. Um, and if you don't have that, it's okay to bootstrap your, your information. Um, you typically want five to 10 utterances per intent. Um, <clears throat> and yes, it is a per a mis perfect, uh, I intentionally misspelled stuff and had poor English, and that is okay. Um, you should really see some of our Missy chat logs. <laughs> um, how else is it going to learn? Um, okay, so when you're training, you, you typically have two ways to train it. There's supervised and then there's unsupervised. Um, so your supervised is typically your step one. So you take that, that pre-made um, pre data with your intents and your entities and the sample utterances and you pass it through your machine learning uh, process. And then once it's done with the machine learning process, you, uh, you start step two. The, the machine learning will send back and it'll say, okay, well, I think these are what you're trying to look for. Um, and it's probably gonna be horrifically wrong the first few times. Um, training takes a long time to, uh, to implement. We were really rushed in building Missy um, using our training. So we actually kind of had to step back a little bit and build like a fuzzy text because we didn't have enough time to train. Um, but we've been running parallel with our training engine. So at any time, whenever the confidence rating gets high enough, we can switch it over and um, return actual correct answers. Um, okay, so in step two, the, in your machine will return your unsupervised training. Um, it's probably going to be wrong. Um, step three would be you confirm or deny, say yes, this is what the, the intent or in the uh, question that I wanted to answer and this is answered correctly. Um, or you could say no, this is way off. And then you take the no's and then you pass them back in through another round of unsupervised training. And you rinse and repeat until your confidence level of what your bot is actually trying to return is, is acceptable and it's not giving off the wall answers. Um, okay, so wrapping up, um, this is kind of what I believe what we're already starting to see will, will happen with bots in the next few years. Um, your speech will solely be your operating system and you're, you're seeing that now in Alexa and Google. Um, there is no interface except for the, the Echo Home. Um, then, and the lines between online and offline will blur, meaning um, there's things called session states that you can return back to your bot and you can actually build proactive bots of say tracking a tracking number through the USPS. Um, and those bots can return um, tracking status whenever it, it gets updated and it can push it to the user. Um, and then three, I, um, I'm guilty of this. Uh, I've been asking Alexa more and more cooking questions instead of going to my phone and trying to find a random recipe. Uh, so we're starting to rely less and less on traditional search engines. Um, I think a cool story that I heard from one of our partners is that he uses Alexa to read to his elderly mother um, the, the books feature. And so she likes to listen to Alexa um, read to her. Uh, so that, that means that you know anybody between the age of my four-year-old daughter and an 80-year-old mother uh, can, can use these devices. And I think that's really cool, a cool part of technology. Um, I know I'm, I was probably pretty quick, but um, I will be in 1A, I think, uh, all day. I'll be living there. 
So if you have any specific questions, if you want to get specific or generic, um, I'll be in there to answer questions, and then I'll be here all day. So uh, thank uh, everybody, especially SIPA, for, for inviting me out here. Um, it was it's a unique opportunity, and I'm very grateful for it. So thank you all. <laughs>